If I could have your attention, let me say good evening to everyone. Uh, I'm Fernando Costa, Assistant City Manager for the City of Fort Worth, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this training session about the use of redistricting software. And uh, we uh, hope that you'll find this session to be uh, informative uh, and, and useful, and we want to hear your comments afterwards about how we can make it uh, even better. Because tonight is just the first of a long series of training sessions that we'll be providing throughout Fort Worth over the next several weeks as we anticipate the Census Bureau releasing block level population data with which we can redraw uh, the boundaries of Fort Worth uh, City Council districts. The Census Bureau by law has until the end of September to release uh, those data, but we understand that they may be releasing the data as early as mid-August, we'll see. But as soon as the data are available, we'll be able to begin drawing real maps of what the next set of council districts might look like. In the meantime, uh, tonight and in uh, the, uh, the training sessions within the next few weeks, we'll be using some unofficial population estimates as the basis for drawing sample maps uh, in a training environment, uh, but eventually we'll have the official data uh, to use for that purpose. All of this is in line uh, with the City Council's intent uh, to make the redistricting process as transparent and participatory as possible. And we have a largely new City Council. Uh, six of the nine uh, Council members uh, are new to the Council. And uh, they'll be learning about redistricting in most cases, just as uh, ordinary citizens uh, are learning about it. Uh, and I know a lot of the folks in the audience tonight, I know uh, that uh, uh, you're knowledgeable uh, and sophisticated in the use of uh, uh, this technology and you understand redistricting, but we'll cover the basics uh, without making uh, any assumptions about your, your background knowledge. Uh, let me... Um, Take a moment, if I may, to introduce the city staff who are here from uh, at least three different uh, departments. So, uh, uh, Michelle Goode is our Director of Communications and Public Engagement. You, you've probably run across Michelle in, in different places. Uh, she's uh, uh, been involved in uh, supporting the redistricting task force uh, uh, and uh, has done a great job in getting the word out about tonight's meeting and about the, the meetings that are uh, yet to come. Uh, and I'll ask the other uh, city staff to introduce themselves, uh, starting with uh, Michelle Swindle. Hi, I'm Michelle Swindle. I'm the IT manager. Sorry. Do we need to, to use the mic, Paul? My name is Michelle Swindle. I'm the IT manager for GIS and public safety applications. And at the back, I have two of my staff members, Anjeev Nepali and Natalie Watkins. Um, I'm Eric Flatiger. I'm with the Planning and Data Analytics Department. We're helping to support this effort. Thanks. Hi, I'm Mark McAvoy. I'm the Director of the Planning and Data Analytics Department. And uh, like Eric said, we're here to help support the effort. I'm Zach Hutchison with the Planning and Data Analytics Department. I'm a senior planner. work both with Mark and Eric and Natalie and Angie quite a bit. Thank you, folks. Uh, all of these staff members are available to answer your questions uh, this evening and uh, in the days ahead. Uh, so if I could uh, draw your attention to the screen, uh, we'd like to, to walk you through uh, some of the uh, basics uh, about redistricting so that we're all uh, on uh, uh, common footing. Uh, and then uh, uh, we'll ask uh, Ms. Swindle to to talk with us about uh, the use of the software itself. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about uh, what we're trying to accomplish uh, in redistricting, uh, talk about what uh, work had, has been done by the redistricting uh, task force established by the City Council. Uh, we'll talk about the uh, procedures that the City Council has adopted uh, for use in redrawing council district boundaries. Uh, uh, then we'll go into an overview of the software itself, uh, which uh, uh, is um, uh, produced by a company called Esri. You'll probably hear that name. Uh, in fact, that they used to capitalize it, but in most recent 
uh, use. I, I don't think they, cap they, they just have the in initial E capitalized. Uh, uh, so it's now. Uh, it used to be an acronym. Environmental Science Research uh, Institute. Institute uh, uh, and, uh, and Michelle will talk about uh, source data definitions and provide a, a demonstration uh, for, for training purposes. And we'll be happy to take your questions. In fact, if, if you have questions at any point, uh, please just raise your hand and we'll take the question at that, at that moment. Uh, feel free to, to do so. Okay. All right, so what, why, who and how? Okay, uh, without uh, uh, reading the whole paragraph, it, it's, uh, uh, we're here to, to redraw uh, the boundaries of city council districts uh, this is a, a process that occurs at different levels of government. Uh, so Tarrant County, Denton County, uh, the different uh, counties will be redrawing their electoral districts. School, school districts will be redrawing their electoral lines. Uh, and of course, the state legislature will be redrawing lines, not just for legislative uh, seats, uh, but for congressional districts uh, as well. That will probably be a, uh, a, a partisan uh, process and uh, fraught with litigation, and uh, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Uh, we we anticipate the the local process to be a lot more tame. At least we, we certainly hope so. Uh, and we encourage you to participate. Uh, uh, we want Fort Worth to be a model of how residents can take part uh, in the redistricting process. They have a real meaningful impact uh, upon the results. Uh, so uh, they're probably two basic reasons why we're doing this. Uh, one is that uh, we're required by, uh, by law to ensure that all of the districts have roughly equal populations. Uh, this is a one person, one vote principle. Uh, and, uh, and we've had so much growth in certain council districts, less growth in others, that over the course of the last 10 years or so, the districts have become unbalanced. So we need to bring them back into balance. In fact, we need to consider uh, skewing them a little bit so that the fast-growing districts begin uh, with a lower population. The slower-growing districts begin with a higher population. So after 10 years, we know they're going to uh, be shifting, uh, and the fast-growing districts will probably, again, lead to an imbalance. Uh, but we want to try to minimize that. Uh, so that's the main purpose. And the second purpose is to accommodate uh, the two new districts that the citizens of Fort Worth uh, 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 created effective with the 2023 uh, city election. So we just had an election a few weeks ago. Uh, the next election is May of 2023. And instead of having eight districts plus the mayor, uh, in the next election, we'll have 10 districts plus the mayor. And so how do we fit in two new districts on top of the eight that we already have? And so you can see that uh, I'm one slide behind. <laughs> okay, thanks, Michelle. Uh, uh, this is just a, a graph of population growth. And you can see how fast Fort Worth is growing. Uh, we're currently estimated uh, to be uh, well over 920,000 population. Uh, who could imagine that? Uh, and uh, and you, can, you can well uh, speculate that in just a few years, at the rate we're growing, uh, we'll cross the million mark. Uh, we're now the, the 12th largest city in the United States uh, and, uh, and one of the, uh, the, the fastest growing uh, cities. Uh, so that, that, that makes redistricting all the, all, all the more um, uh, important. Uh, okay. Uh, the, uh, the redistricting task force established last summer by the city council it has completed its work. They, they've been formally dissolved, although accept, we expect them to get back together one more time for a joint work session with the city council after the census data are available. But they set three broad goals uh, for, for their work. First, to prevent gerrymandering. Gerrymandering is the, uh, the infamous process where, whereby uh, districts uh, are uh, drawn uh, for partisan purposes, often with irregular uh, features to gain advantage over the other party. Uh, we want to prevent that. We want the, the process to be uh, as rational as possible. We want to provide the best opportunities to elect council members who reflect the diverse population of Fort Worth. Uh, Fort Worth not only has grown uh, in, uh, uh, in general population, but 
would become increasingly diverse. As of the last census, uh, we were already a majority minority city, if you, if you think of persons of color as, as minorities. Uh, Hispanics represented 34% of the population, probably a greater percentage today. African Americans, 18%, other races, 6%. Uh, the task force wanted to be sure that in drawing the district boundaries, we, did, we would do as much as we could to provide fair opportunities for all uh, segments of the population to gain fair representation. And finally, they wanted to emphasize the promotion of education and public participation, uh, as we're doing tonight. Yes, please. Okay, so uh, last summer in August, the, the council created this uh, task force uh, for the purpose of recommending criteria and procedures by which the council would redraw uh, the district boundaries in, in anticipation of the May 2023 uh, election. And they delivered their recommendations to the council in March of this year. Uh, the final criteria procedures were approved by a resolution that the council adopted uh, on April 6 of this year. So we have official criteria and procedures now, okay? And, and these are the criteria. Uh, the council divided them into two categories, high priority uh, and lower priority, and they're not depicted in any particular order. Uh, but the first one is that each district be roughly equal size. Uh, second, that we comply with all pertinent uh, uh, legal requirements. Uh, with uh, no packing of minority voters, and we'll explain that in a moment, no fragmentation of, uh, of minority communities. Uh, it's called packing and cracking. Uh, that's th those are practices that we want to uh, prevent. Uh, and no retrogression in the ability of minorities to participate in the electoral process. They wanted to create minority opportunity districts uh, where a uh, majority of the voting age population uh, would be comprised of persons of color. Uh, they wanted to contain, or at least provide the opportunity to contain communities of interest within single council districts. Now, community of interest is defined as a the local population with shared socioeconomic characteristics and political institutions that would benefit from unified representation. So for example, uh, we recently got uh, a, a message from uh, the, um, the Riverside Alliance saying we want Riverside uh, uh, to be uh, a community of interest. We got a message from uh, the East Side Alliance of Neighborhoods, uh, and they want the East Side to be a community of interest. Now, that's a very large area, uh, but they want to be contained within one council district. I believe they're currently within three council districts, uh, but they want to be contained within one. So that's going to be a big challenge, uh, meeting this criterion. In fact, you will probably discover that it's going to be very difficult, perhaps even impossible, to meet all the criteria simultaneously. Uh, it's going to be difficult. And you'll see once you, you start playing with the numbers, because sometimes uh, they conflict. You want to meet one criterion, you have a hard time meeting the other, and so forth. And then we want contiguous territory. Uh, thanks, Michelle. And then we move on to the lower priority criteria, compact districts, uh, and the council eventually settled on a a particular measure called the, the polsby popper ratio, uh, which is a mathematical definition of compactness. Now, I, I didn't think that there was much mathematics associated with compactness, but I had not met Byron Ellison. Byron Ellison uh, is a phenomenal expert on the mathematics. I'm, I'm sure he's an expert on a lot of things, but he's an expert on the mathematics of compactness. And I've learned that there are at least a dozen commonly used uh, formulas to measure compactness. But the one that was uh, eventually adopted by the council was this polsby popper ratio. There are others that are arguably just as good. Uh, you just settle on one. And so this is a way of saying compactness is not just in the eye of the beholder. There are w mathematical ways to measure the compactness of a geographic area uh, with a perfect circle having uh, a ratio of, a perfect ratio of one. Now, we're not going to have any perfectly circular districts, but that would be, hypothetically, a perfectly co compact district. Identifiable geographic boundaries, such as streams, railroad tracks, and, and highways, contain whole voting precincts within 
uh, single districts, contain whole census blocks or block groups, and finally, do not consider place of residence of incumbents or potential candidates. This is actually different from the criteria that the City Council adopted uh, for the 2010, the post-2010 redistricting, because at that time they actually said that preserving uh, incumbent constituent relations was one of the criteria, one of the objectives, uh, which is a way of preserving uh, the uh, electability of uh, current uh, council members. So that is something that we now intentionally seek to avoid. Okay, thanks for that. And uh, here are some criteria uh, uh, defined. Uh, packing, uh, concentrating like-minded voters together in one district to, to reduce their voting power. Uh, and cracking is, is really uh, uh, the opposite in a sense, is spreading like-minded voters across multiple districts. And if you, if you really wanna dilute uh, the voting strength of a group, whatever that group might be, you engage in a combination of packing and cracking, uh, and we can show you an example, and it, and it can uh, minimize the voting power of that group. Oh, here, here you go. Uh, and so you can see uh, on, on, on top uh, a, a hypothetical community uh, in which uh, uh, minorities or persons of color de are depicted in purple, and they represent 60% of the population, 60%. But uh, by having uh, cracking and packing, that is to say having two districts that are heavily minority and three where the, where the minority is just below 50%, you can uh, ensure an outcome where, whereby only 40% of the elected body, if, if you vote by straight uh, demographic lines, only 40% represent the 60% uh, uh, majority. Uh, so that's, that's an example, uh, a hypothetical example of how the practice of packing and cracking can distort uh, the representation of your, your population. Okay, thanks, Michelle. Uh, so we just discussed packing and cracking, minority opportunity districts, we talked about that a little bit earlier, uh, and voting age uh, uh, population. Okay, thanks, Michelle. Uh, and, and here we can see, in reference to packing and cracking, uh, the existing city council uh, districts uh, and, and how uh, we've got uh, uh, a majority of those districts uh, either being a combined uh, minority opportunity district uh, or a, a specifically a Hispanic uh, opportunity district. Uh, and uh, as of uh, the, uh, the 2012 map, uh, there are no uh, uh, districts in, in which African Americans uh, uh, constituted a, a majority of the voting age uh, population. Okay. Okay. So what's coming up? Uh, these are these are the procedures that uh, the city council has uh, agreed to follow. Uh, they we will be registering. We are now registering communities of interest. So if you happen to represent a neighborhood or a collection of neighborhoods, uh, and you want to be sure that you are contained within a single city council district, then we would ask you to register with the city of Fort Worth to, to notify uh, our uh, communication public engagement department. I think we have a, a, a information on our website, Michelle. Yeah, we'll send them all over and share Terrific. So uh, s send us the boundaries of the community of interest that you'd like for the city to recognize, and that th then will be subject to this criterion. Uh, the city council will be obligated to, uh, to consider uh, placing that community of interest entirely within a single uh, council district. Again, it may be difficult to do, but that would be the, the objective. Uh, second, uh, uh, and this is why we're here tonight, resident produced redistricting plans. Uh, Last time, uh, after the 2010 census, we, we did something similar to this. I think the degree of interest has elevated greatly uh, after the uh, 2020 census. Uh, but we did have um, citizens uh, last time uh, producing their own proposed uh, council district maps, which the city council did consider. Uh, and uh, in fact, if, I, uh, if uh, my friends, uh, uh, Dr. Miller, 
uh, Mr. Elson, uh, don't mind my giving you a plug. Uh, there is a group called uh, Citizens for Independent Redistricting that has produced, a, I think, an excellent video, very educational video, about redistricting uh, as, it, as it took place in Fort Worth after the 2010 census. I expect you still have it on the website. It's, uh, it's on our web page. Great. Facebook page. Terrific. Thank you. Well, it, it, it's very well done. Uh, and actually, I, th I think it's a little humorous, too. If, uh, but Byrick is the well, Byrick, Byrick's a master at this kind of thing. Uh, but it, it gives you how it actually happened. Uh, and um, I, it, it is, I, I only say it because it is factually accurate. Uh, and uh, I think uh, balanced and, and fair about how it presents what happened. Uh, and, and so it, it'll show you an example of how uh, at least one of the district boundaries was almost precisely aligned with what one of the residents submitted for consideration. So uh, these maps were, were, were treated seriously and, and I fully expect that they'll be given every consideration this time around uh, because the process is gonna be even more transparent than it was uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and so uh, we'll, we'll talk more about it uh, in, in due course, but uh, any citizen will be able to submit a map and, and as long as it meets the criteria and, and the staff can confirm that it meets the criteria, it'll be submitted to the council for their consideration. So it won't be tossed aside. Uh, it will be considered. Staff will take all of these maps submitted by residents, will try to uh, draw out the best features of, of these maps and staff itself will submit a proposed map. And the city council will select one of those maps, either the staff produced map or one of the resident produced maps, and use that as a starter map for the redistricting process. So at least, uh, at least in theory, this is democracy uh, in, its, in its purest form. Uh, so that's resident produced redistricting uh, uh, plans. They'll select an initial map as a starting point, and then they'll adjust that map uh, through a series of, uh, of hearings and work sessions to produce uh, the, the final map. Yes, Bruce. So the initial map is not gonna be made by the law firm that? No, 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 no. No, the, the, the initial map, well, the initial map will be selected by the city council from a collection of maps that will include a staff produced map and all the resident produced maps that meet the criteria. Uh, we, will, we will rely on our own law department to provide legal advice and the law department is, in turn we'll have an outside law firm to provide some over-the-shoulder over uh, advice as well. But uh, uh, the council, in the, in the resolution that they adopted, uh, establishing the, the, the procedures, decided that, that we did not need to hire an outside firm to produce a map. And in San Antonio, just to give you an example, uh, the city actually hired an outside law firm to produce the starter map. Uh, so as to ensure that whatever map they started with at least uh, could withstand any legal challenges. Uh, but that was not a, a highly participatory process. Uh, we think we can have participation and legal validity at the same time. We're confident uh, that we can, uh, as long as we meet the criteria uh, for, for drawing uh, council district boundaries. So, uh, no, we, uh, that's, that's, the council will select one of those maps, either produced by a resident or produced by city staff, uh, as a starter map. And then they'll adjust the boundaries from that point. But thank you for that question, uh, Bruce. Uh, redistricting is a single agenda item. This is, this is something that the, the task force specifically recommended. Uh, if, they're gonna, if the city council is going to be talking about uh, maps and drawing maps, that can't be done as an incidental uh, part of an ordinary city council meeting. They have to have a, a meeting specifically called for the purpose of, uh, of redistricting. So that will shine a bright light and, and make the public aware of what the city council is doing. The whole purpose is to be transparent, to do everything in, in, in the sunshine. Uh, public hearings, there will be multiple public hearings, at least one, even before they select that initial map to hear from the public about what the public would like to see in the initial map. Then, then after they select that map, a second public hearing uh, on the map, but before they consider any changes to the map. So they, again, they hear from the public about uh, how that initial map ought to be adjusted. 
Uh, and then, after they produce a proposed map, at least four public hearings uh, by paired uh, council districts uh, on that proposed map. So at least six public hearings, there may be more, but at least those six are required by the resolutions the city council adopted. And then finally, transparency. Uh, no backroom communications, they must occur in official meetings. Uh, that's that's a, a, a radical change from the way redistricting uh, is historically done in, in virtually any community. Uh, so any, any discussions about redistricting are to, of a substantive nature are to occur uh, in public at official meetings. Uh, in the past, you'd have a couple of council members getting together, working out a deal, and, uh, and then presenting the deal uh, as a done uh, agreement uh, at the time that they took action. That is not consistent with the procedures the council uh, has adopted, okay? So we've divided the, the schedule into two phases, pre-redistricting, which is what we're doing now, and then after the census data are available, what we call uh, redistricting. So pre-redistricting, as we get ready for the census data to become uh, available, we're conducting the, the software training. We're registering communities of interest. Uh, we expect to receive the block level census data uh, no later than the end of September. Again, could be earlier than that. Uh, and uh, we'll kick off uh, the process with a joint work session by the former redistricting task force and the new city council. I anticipate uh, that that could be a very important uh, meeting uh, uh, in which the the redistricting task force can explain the, the, the criteria and procedures uh, and the rationale behind them to the, to the new council members, okay? And then uh, we'll begin, begin the, the formal redistricting process. Uh, we'll allow uh, several weeks uh, around the month of November for residents to produce uh, those redistricting plans using the, the skills that you're able to gather tonight and in, and in other uh, uh, training sessions. Uh, you, you'll be able to go online. I understand that uh, a video of tonight's session will be available on the city's website. Uh, and there will be multiple opportunities for people to, to learn how to use the software at home if they wish. Uh, I, I think an in-person training is the best way to, to learn, but uh, uh, we want to be sure that anyone who wants to use the software can use it. Uh, at their home computer. If they don't have a home computer, they can go to a library, a community center, and gain access to one. We're training city staff in multiple departments uh, that interface with, with the public uh, about how to train citizens on the use uh, of the software. Uh, and we want the software, and we'll ask you to tell us uh, after tonight's session, we want the software to be uh, user-friendly so that uh, anyone uh, with uh, an ordinary knowledge of, of computers can use the software. You don't have to be, you shouldn't have to be an expert in geographic information systems to use the software. And, it, and if, you, if you believe that, it, it's, that, that there are ways that we can make the training simpler or the software itself more user friendly, please tell us because that's, that's, our, uh, that's our goal. So uh, November uh, given to the production of these resident produced plans. In December, uh, after we collect and, uh, and assess these plans with respect to the criteria and produce our, our own staff uh, uh, map, we will brief the city council and, and present all this information to the council. Uh, the council will then have that public hearing that I mentioned earlier in January. They'll select an initial map, then they'll have the, uh, the, the subsequent public hearing all in January. Uh, and then we've allowed two months for the council to produce a proposed map. And then the month of April will be given to the, the public hearings on the proposed map before the city council takes any action. We're recommending to the council aim to adopt a, a new council district's uh, map by the end of April, uh, although practically they could take up to two more months uh, to, uh, to act on a, uh, a final map. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, by mid-July, we want the map to have been adopted because that's uh, the time by which a prospective uh, city council candidate 
must establish residency within the council district that they wish to represent. Uh, filing uh, for seats on the city council uh, would occur in, from mid-January to mid-February of 2023, and then the election would occur in May of that year. Okay. All right. Uh, before we uh, ask uh, uh, Michelle Swindle to talk uh, with us about the redistricting software, may I answer any questions about uh, redistricting criteria or procedures uh, or the uh, process that we intend to follow? Okay. Any questions? And I know a lot of a lot of folks in, in the room tonight have been involved uh, in uh, discussions about redistricting, so I, I bet you you know. Uh, this subject as, as well as city staff does. Uh, but uh, if there are no questions, I'll uh, introduce Michelle Swindle. Thank you much. As he mentioned, my name is Michelle Swindle and I'm the IT manager. So I'm intimately familiar with Esri and GIS. Um, a little background, I've been doing GIS for over 15 years. Um, I've had experience with the, sorry, desktop version of the redistricting software. And now we're moving to the web-based, which has a lot more opportunity for citizen interaction. Um, the main highlights of the new web version of the software is that it is web, it's easily accessible. You don't have to buy special software um, it's in the cloud, so all the data is saved in one location. You can use it anywhere. It also has collaborative aspects of it, so users can cr create their own plans and then share those across groups and say, I'm only really interested in my own neighborhood information, so I'll take a plan that someone else has created that looks good enough and it validates. Then I can make my own specific changes get it to validate, and then submit that to city staff for the changes that I want to see made. Um, it also has built-in tools and checks. There is both data integrity checks as well as compactness tests. So there's a myriad, I think there's 10, that it runs through just in its own internal system, and it does those calculations and provides those out. Um, for you as the end user to make that decision how you want to move forward. Um, and also provide clarity and transparency. So everything is done through the portal. There's no kind of back door. It's all available as much as you want it to be. There are links that you should have been provided previously and they'll be on the website as well. Um, these are Esri generated links and videos. Um, if you have additional questions, it, go, it does a deep dive into the software, um, and there's YouTube playlist as well. Um, as Fernando mentioned, the 2020 census data was delayed, so we're anticipating it in September. Um, the vendor has mentioned that they need at least a 30-day lead time. So from whenever they get it, they'll update their demographic information and add that to the software. So as soon as that's available, you can start creating your own new plans. Um, and the 2010 census total was 741,206 people. And that's what we used to create those target populations for our templates. Um, there's basically three methods that you can use when you start using this data. You can use existing templates. City staff, my team, we created templates uh, for 40 districts. There we go. Um, so we divided the entire city into 40 huge districts based on neighborhood districts and minority opportunity districts. And uh, the target population for each of those was around 183,000 people. So you can take any of those districts, combine them, and then create your total 10 districts. Make sense? Um, does anyone have any questions about that methodology, how we got to where we did for those templates? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> 
you're saying is that those numbers will change from 74,000 per district to 100,000 per district. If you so Correct. Okay. Yeah. Once the 2020 census data is available, we'll make those changes. 92,000. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. that's right. Uh, uh, 92,000 times 10 would be about 920, if that's what the census shows. Correct. So for the training agenda, there's account management that we'll be showing you, um, collaboration methods, sorry, um, map navigation, the templates that we created and your options for that, how to create a plan and validate it, and some of those validation checks, and then sharing it and submitting it to the city. So we're gonna have everyone create a logon. You should have navigated to this website previously. So if you're on your laptop, if you'll log in. And there's city staff at the back that can assist if you have questions if you have issues getting to the URL. But we're going to recommend that everyone create a logon tonight. So as you're navigating, there's a create an account button. Two things I wanna make sure that everyone's aware of is one, it's case sensitive. So however you type it into the uh, box for your username, make sure to remember that casing, uppercase, lowercase. And we also recommend that you correlate your username to your email address just for consistency. You can have multiple accounts using the same email address, but all usernames have to be unique. So a household can use one email address, address to receive password updates and notifications, but your username has to be unique. The system won't let you have two Joe Smiths. There's not currently. Um, it'll be on the website. So the question was, is this the permanent URL? And this is the current one for the website, but we will have redirects from the city website. but this is the primary URL to get logged into the, to the portal. So if everyone will create a logon, choosing your first name, last name, username, email address, and entering it in a password. Yes. Would you say the username, anything I want? It can be anything you want. We just recommend that it's the first of your email address. So in this example, joe.smith at gmail. The username would be joe.smith. Yep. And then the password can be anything that you'd like it to be. And you can always change it later. Just be sure to remember the casing. So if you use capitals for creating that username, remember that. Because you'll need that to reset your password. So just remember how you type it in. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 That's, always, that's always a trick. <laughs> <laughs> just trying to remember. Because you got nine jillion of them, you know. And it's, so. so has everyone created a logon? And you should see, see the screen and pass through. So this is how you recover a password if you've forgotten it. There's a button at the bottom that says, forgot your password. You plug it in and just remember that everything is case sensitive or you'll get the big nasty notice button. And you'll have to do it again. Cool. There's also security questions that can help recovering your password. And then you can always change your password as well. So once you've navigated into the site, there's an account at the top, and you'll click that and change your user profile. So 
this is what the map looks like. As I mentioned, there's a profile section at the top. Then you have your toolbars, which we'll go through in detail. Your information panel on the left. This little button here is collapsible. So similar to Microsoft products, all of the panes and panels are adjustable based on the size of your browser. So they'll accommodate to whatever size your window is and you can make the information panel and at the bottom, the district window. You can make them as large as small as you need as well as popping some of them out just to make it easier for you to navigate. So the section in the middle is your map area. And as I mentioned, the district window, this holds all of the tabular data for your demographic information. Is there any questions about the look and feel? And we'll go through the specific tabs as well. So from the file, this is where you create new plans, open existing ones, save, and save as. The save as button is very important because all of the templates are read only, meaning once you launch a new template, you'll have to save it as your own and you can name it whatever you want. And you can change that privacy, that it can be just yours and then you can share it with others, or you can create it that any user, new or future, has access to it. Then we have the Learn tab. This is Esri created. All of this content is specific to the redistricting application. Um, there's really good FAQ section and it helps walk through the methodology as well. So after this, as you're going through and you have questions about specific tools and buttons, um, this is a really good resource to use. Then we have the View tab. This is gonna be important when you're going through and creating your new districts and your number of districts and getting your target population value. Then we have the Create tab. This is where your demographic and reporting information is going to live. Um, you can also change your background theme and your base map. So this is the look and feel for what your map's gonna look like. Then the review button. This is where your data checks come in, the integrity check, as well as the compactness tests. And you can also see plans for your demographic information. Then the share tab. This is where you can manage your groups and your profile. And then the submit button. This is how you submit your plan to city staff. So this is the look and feel of the map. And as I mentioned, the district window, this is gonna be really important when, once we dive into the demographic information. Um, and there's a button that you can pop it out. The left panel, as I mentioned, this is how you expand and collapse this pane. So once it launches, it's gonna be hidden. And then once you click this over arrow, it'll expand. This is how you can search. If you're looking for areas like churches or schools or uh, businesses, you can search for that information here and it'll zoom to it on your map. So it can help give a frame of reference for the area that you're looking at. The next panel is the contents. This is the table of contents. Um, all the data can be turned on and off. These are maps that IT and Esri created, all of this base data. So if there's anything additional that you'd like to see, you can add that to this map. But we have um, topographic map as well as the Texas 2010, that's your census data for the 2010 census. Um, themes are additional background information. And then the CMO reference redistricting 2020. This is all the city data that you'll be using. So the button here, this is how you expand that. And then just the check mark boxes, turning things on and off. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Does that just show the district boundaries um, as they exist today, or will it also show the schools that feed into the same pyramid? 
it does not show, it only shows school district boundaries. It doesn't show um, theaters. Correct. Is it possible for, um, for um, us to get like the schools that feed into the same pyramids so that as we're mapping communities of interest, uh, neighborhoods that are feeding into the same school, you know, the same school pyramid? Um, we can look into it, but I'm, I'm, I think that the information's on the TEA website, uh, those attendance zones. So, yeah, we can look at adding that to it. And someone at the back is writing that down for me because I don't have a pen. Oh. Um, that is a question. Is there any other base data that you'd be interested in seeing on the map? In addition, in addition, in addition to attendance zones. Okay. Um, and then the legend. If you're ever curious what some of the boundaries are, this is the tab that you'd go to to see what the information you're looking at is. And then identify. So if you're seeing colors and buttons and seeing information on the map and you're unsure which layer is turned on and which one you're looking at, there's an identify button back on your view toolbar and you use this section, identify from, and then you select what information you wanna see. So if you're wanting to see neighborhood organizations, you select it from the pick list and then you use the identify button and you click on the map. You can also use it to identify and select assignments. So if you're wanting to add a specific neighborhood organization to a district, then you'd use this tab to select your neighborhood organization that you already selected and then you use from the pick list your district and you assign it. All right, is there any questions about the buttons? We'll dig into it a little. Mm -hmm. So does the database contain all the city neighborhood associations? It has all of the ones that are currently registered. So as new uh, communities of interest are created and are registered, they'll be added to the list, yes. So yep. It doesn't just contain or like it, all the neighborhood associations. It has... Well, like 300, aren't there? Yeah. Yeah. So that's just about all. Yeah. So there are neighborhood organizations that are registered through the city, and all of those are on here. And there's neighborhood organizations and HOAs. Yep. Mm-hmm. I would like to say that the ones that are no longer active have been removed, but you can't quote me on that. <laughs> but if you know of ones that need to be removed, if you'll let us know and we can update the data accordingly. So. Any other questions about data? I love talking about data. Okay. Um, so now we'll hop into groups and collaboration. Creating a group and sharing amongst your group is going to be the biggest key piece of this entire redistricting process. Um, any user can create a group. So if you have a defined organization that you're working for, or if it's just your neighbors, or if it's people who work at the same school as you, you can create groups for them and you can share plans accordingly. Um, the caveat to that is users cannot go searching for groups. So if you create a group uh, no one can go find you. You have to physically invite users to your group. Um, the other caveat to that is if you create plans and you share them amongst that group and you do not include a city admin, we can't go recover plans. So if you created a plan, somebody made changes to it, they saved it, they overrid something that you did, and you're trying to recover data, if we're not included in your group, we can't help you recover any of that. And we can't view any of the plans that you've shared if they're exclusive to that group. So you can always create groups and invite people, but people can't go searching for you. So there is some anonymity to that. Um, we've created an admin group for this uh, ad 
email address. So when you go searching, you can create a group under the manage group. Oh, you can't see my. Y'all didn't tell me you couldn't see my cursor. So there's the manage groups button. You create a new group, give it a detailed name so that when you're inviting someone, they know what group they're being included in. And then you can add people to your group. So you'll search for names. If you search for council redistricting, then you can find the city admin and add them to your group. And then you can send the invitation or you can remove users as necessary. Um, and on the same note, all members can leave groups as well. So if you see that you have an invite on the profile bar, then you can always accept or reject. And then once you get to the group, you can leave. A dialog box will open. It may take a while to leave a group, so just be cognizant of that and don't click anything and it'll the dialog box will go away. Any questions about groups or sharing or any of the profile management stuff? Okay. So, creating your plan. As I mentioned earlier, we have um, three different templates that you can use. There's a IT created one that has 40 districts. So you can combine those and join them to create your final 10. There's one that has the 2010 council boundaries. So you can use that as a starting place, which is essentially our current uh, council districts that you can add and remove. Or if you want, you can create your own. Something to take note of is that the software will not auto assign districts. So if you create a new plan and you say, I want 10 districts for the city of Fort Worth, it will give you 10 districts and all of the data, all of the city will be in an unassigned district. So you have to physically add all of those areas to whichever district you want. So the process that we're gonna use for this demonstration is using the existing 40 so that you can just group them as wanted, as needed and get your target areas. You can always go back and change them to meet whatever specifications and criteria that you're looking for, but this is just a generic starting point that we're giving you a template to work from. Um, Mm -hmm. So are you going to redraw those districts once the new data comes in? Correct. So once the 2020 census data comes out, we'll create new templates based on that information. Yep. Any other questions? Okay. So um, if you go to, you've logged in, you should see three templates on your page. So, I've logged in. I mean, and you have three plans available. The neighborhood plan, this is your 40 district one. You can always start with our current or the blank, but for in the, um, in the spirit of time and ease, we're using the 40 for this demonstration. So you open your plan and you see all 40 districts. Does anyone have any problems opening an existing plan? Fantastic. So that was the 40 district plan. And as I mentioned, there's the 2010 which should look very familiar. And you can also open the blank slate template. So you see down at the bottom 
unassigned has 741,206 population, and then all the others have a negative target deviation. So this means that they're empty and you have to go fill them. So, as I mentioned earlier, all of the templates are read-only. So, if you want to make any changes, you'll need to save as and give it a name. So, if y'all want to create one now, feel free. So, you'll click this Save As button. And you'll give it a name and your description. Now that you're the owner of this plan, you can share it amongst your groups. So you can either share it, make the permissions and privileges everyone, or you can just share it with a group. So now that you're looking through the data, as I mentioned, there are 40 existing districts and we're getting down to 10. That means you'll need to join four of them to get your target population. Does that make sense? Fantastic. Okay, so now you'll join districts together. Um, something to be aware of, there isn't an undo button. You can't go back and say, I joined these together. Oops, I gotta go back. Which is why you've saved as, and you can save and you can save often. So if you made a change and you want to back out, you can always close it if you haven't saved. So close your window or just reload your browser. So you can click the you click on your URL and just hit enter and it takes you back to the sign in. So there isn't an official undo button, but I guess that's the unofficial oopsie. So it'll say, do you want to recover? And I say, nope. Open a brand new one. So now we'll be joining. So where did you get to the joining? There is a toolbar. Let me go back. So, oh, I didn't want to create. Signing in, opening my plan. It's even. Yes, join districts. Sorry, on the view tab, not the create tab. Correct. So if I zoom in and I want to join. I can pick it from here or I can pick it on my list. So if I want to join District 21, 20, and 19. You said on the view tab. Correct. I, I can back up if you need. Yep. So I want to join District 21 and 20 to District 19. Oh, I didn't save my plan. See, I'm not taking my own advice. Um, M Swindle 10 District Plan. So now I can join, I'm adding them to District 19, 20, 21. And now District 20 and 21 have disappeared and District 19 is larger. So if you look down at my table of contents, Yep. 
So District 20 and 21 now have zero. So you'll continue to join until you only have 10 districts that have population and all the others are zero. Does that methodology make sense? Does anyone have questions about the process of joining? Cool. Okay. So we've gone through, we've joined, we've got empty districts. Now we can customize and join and add and remove explicit block groups. So if I want to add modify districts, wait, where's my button? Actually, let me do it this way. So from the Create tab, you picked your district. You identify which ones you want to join. Then you select your geography. And now you've created them. Does it make sense? No. Okay. So we're creating, we're adding, let's add it back to District 19. Let's zoom in. So we're going to select, let's add this section, and it's added to my district. You drag and drop and say, let's go all the way here. And you can continue to add as much as you'd like. So are you using, you're using the second tool from the left? Correct. So it's selecting by rectangle. You can use any of these. Okay. You can use the one to pick the whole geometry. Or if you want to draw a big polygon, let's add. So if we made District 19 a little too big, and we get, want to give it back to District 16, we can draw our fun little section. So you click once to start drawing, you trace it to whatever you want it to look like, and then you double click to finish drawing. So now I have it desi designed and I can save my plan and now I've changed District 16 and 19. Um, so if I say District 16 looks how I want it to look, you can always lock it. So if you say, all right, District 16 is locked, I don't wanna make any more changes to it, but I like all the other information, all the other area in this section to be selected. So. Does that make sense or do I need to clarify that statement? Okay. So, mm hmm When I joined four districts, the district names disappeared from the map. All of Correct. They'll disappear from the map, but not from the table. Yeah. You'll get to swap districts after you've joined. Yeah. So this was just adding additional areas. If the, if after you've added the four districts to create your one bigger district, but it left off a neighborhood that you wanted included in that specific district, that's where you can go in here and customize, and you can choose those specific blocks. The other caveat to doing it manually is you can't break block district, sorry, block groups. They have to be full census blocks. The software can't divide them. So if, so if um, Riverside Alliance is larger or smaller than one census block, you'll have to expand that to make sure that you've covered all of those residents. Typically, 
um, blocks align with city streets. It doesn't always happen. And sometimes neighborhoods expand a little farther out and self-identified neighborhoods expand even farther. So you have to make that judgment call whether you want to include this block in your district or if you want to assign it to another one. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that the final map will have to conform to the census plan? The question was, will the final map have to conform to census blocks? And the answer is yes. You can't divide block, census blocks. We'll find out in, hopefully in September what the new census blocks are, whenever they're, that, and the 2020 census date is released. We're hoping for August, it'll probably be September. Hmm? The census, we hadn't talked about releasing that. Uh, we probably can release a census block map and have that on the website as well. Hmm? Can you generally define a census block? Uh, we'll give an example as it is now. Um, if I can define a census block, it is the area with which the census has defined you are a total group. So voter precincts are census blocks that have been joined together to create a larger area. For most... Uh, I probably can. Let me unlock this. Yeah, the black outline there, the black outlines are all individual census blocks. So you'll see the numbering and the number of people within each census block. So all of these are, are your census blocks. They're purely defined by the census and however they choose to draw those boundaries. Um, they typically do follow roadways and natural streams, um, but there is some leeway to that. So all of these are blocks. Um, and just for general knowledge, the way that the census divides its data is there are census blocks and then there's census block groups. So the block is your building block for all of your census data. And then you combine those into census block groups. You had a question? This might be more of a historic question. So why does the criteria contain more census blocks or block groups a lower priority item if the system can force us to do it? Because there can always be additional caveats to not necessarily con being confined to whatever the census um, defined. So if they think that these blocks need to be combined because a roadway does divide them um, just for the aesthetics of the map, then you can divide those block groups. Because there are a few block groups, sorry, blocks that straddle um, highways. So just for aesthetics of the map, dividing those would be better for the map so that you don't have a little jut out that crosses. So, correct. That would be a manual change that would have to be done afterwards. So that's part of the um, additional changes that'll be made once they have their final plans and they look at them, they say, oh, this block straddles 35. Let's cut that, make 35, all the way down from this street to that street as your dividing line. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. So now that we've joined our data and we've set our new districts, you're going to swap. So swapping is essentially renaming. So you're taking your 40 districts, and if you've, since I joined uh, 19, 20, and 21, and 22 into a single district, uh, and if I joined district one, two, three, and four, then I can, re I can swap my new district 19 with district two. 
This essentially is renaming District 19 to District 2. Does that make sense? Do I need restate? Cool. So once you've renamed or swapped all of your other districts, so you only have population in districts 1 through 10 or 2 through 11, sorry, um, then you have your final 10 districts. Okay? So once you have those, you'll reduce the number of districts. So like I said on the view tab, it says 40 and you'll change that to 10. I haven't swapped yet, so it tells me I can't. So you'll swap it back and you'll give it 10 and then you'll see you only have 10 districts. So since Fort Worth historically has an at-large um, district one and the other districts are two through 11, um, you can name it that way and leave district one blank and you'll have a final of, it'll call it 11 districts and that's fine, the system can accept that. Um, or you can just rename it to one through 10, just for simplicity. So you don't get confused and leave some things in district one and it says that you haven't fully validated because you still have a um, target deviation that's larger than what you're looking for. Okay, so after we've re reduced, now we get to validation. Or do we have any additional questions on swapping, joining census information? Is there anything about creating your districts that y'all have additional questions about or problems or anything that's not clear yet? Okay. So the two validation methods are either manual or automatic. So after I've created my 10 final districts, I can go through and go through all of these checks. The integrity check, it does all of the back-end spatial checks and your geography checks, and it makes sure that the um, integrity of the um, space is true. So if it's not contiguous, if there's holes, if there's donuts, if you missed a block, um, that's the check that it'll go through. You can also do the compactness tests and it goes through 10 standard um, compactness tests that the software has. Um, you can also do district distribution and that's where you can look at the I talk about this a little later, um, but you can change the demographic data if you're looking for specific values for um, Hispanics or indigenous or whatever your um, demographic criteria that you're looking for, that's where you see that information. Um, or it does an automatic validation. So before you submit, it will make you, it'll force you to validate. So you can't share a plan or submit a plan unless you've ran these validation checks. So these are the validation types that I was mentioning. Um, the histogram chart, this is your ideal demographic because they're all fairly, they're all within 10% of population from each other. Compactness tests. Um, it does polygon area test, perimeter test, REAC test, area convex hull test, the Groffman test, Schwartzberg, uh, Polsey Popper, and I thought there was one more after that. Let's check. So review, come back, Ms. Tess, in holes. So District 11 has a hole. So it's not going to let me submit because I got a big donut in the middle. Um, and as Fernando mentioned earlier, all of these compactness tests 
are up to the user to define if they meet um, the compactness threshold that you're looking for. So the system just says these are your compactness scores. Do with them as you wish. Do they meet your criteria? Yes or no. And you can always go back in and run the compactness test to make sure that you're meeting that threshold. Um, plan distribution. So it's your perfect pie chart. And then your integrity chart. Uh, which I'll talk a little bit at the end. So your district distribution. This is where you get into the fun of demographics. So if you click district distribution, you choose whatever demographic information you're looking for and you select your category. So you pick your district that you're wanting to see. Mm -hmm. This one's for district three. Um, what, it dem what its demographic makeup breakdown comes down to. Um, your standard VAP, which is your voting age population. Uh, we chose the standard because it's the, um, we wanna do all of this based on voting age population, uh, just to be respectful of the one person, one vote mentality. Um, it also breaks it down to different demographic groups. As you see, there's a universe, there's alternative, uh, there's standard. These are demographic definitions that um, they've kind of evolved over the years of the census, um, and standard is the demographic that we chose. There's also a link which Esri has gone into really good detail about the difference. Sorry. So it says, this is what the uh, abbreviation is, Hispanic over voting age of, over the 18, non-Hispanic, white, non-Hispanic, black, non-Hispanic, American Indian, Alaskan Native, non-Hispanic, Asian, non-Hispanic, um, non-Hispanic Hawaiian or Pacific Islander and other or more than one um, minority. So when you go back to the slides, it's what these uh, definitions are. So if you see some of these, the more than one minority non-Hispanic the link is very helpful to break down those definitions and um, get a little more insight into how Esri is using the demographic information. Um, are there any questions about the demographic information? No? Okay. Um, then sharing your plan. As I mentioned earlier, you have to own your plan before you can share it. So once you open a template, you always want to save as. That means you're the owner. You can edit it as will, at will, and you can share it with your groups. Uh, you can also change the access level and permissions to make it available for everyone. I recommend not necessarily making it available for everyone until you've made your changes. You can always change the per privileges later but if you're still working on it and you don't want someone to see all of the crazy things that you're still working on, you can make it restricted and then you can allow people to access it. Um, then the submit. As I mentioned before with the integrity test, um, it'll identify the sections that don't make, meet your integrity test. So when this was ran, there was still null assignments. So it, it hadn't been completed. You click the zoom to button, it'll zoom to it on the map, and then you can resolve all of those errors. Connectivity, if it's not contiguous, then you click on the details, it'll zoom to that area and show you the error. Um, there are other validation checks based on the task force criteria. Um, you can feel free to go through those on your own 
or you can submit them to city staff and they'll validate them based on the task force criteria and communicate back with you. Um, as I mentioned, there's a email address dedicated for submitting your plans and questions. So if you want to, once you create a group, add this to your group, you can always share and collaborate and say, this is what we've got, or we ran into this issue, and you can communicate. Um, so quick recap, there are three different templates that you can use when creating your own maps. The IT created 40 district one, the 2010 city bound, uh, sorry, council district map template, or the blank slate, which everything will be unassigned and you'll manually have to assign your own. Um, this is where I also recommend that you share amongst your peers and your groups and collaborate and say, all right, I did my district. Oh, you live in this district, you've done yours. Let's compare, let's share, and go through that way. Any questions, comments, concerns? Yeah. Question on collaboration. Mm -hmm. Is what, what's your recommendation for coordinating with uh, multiple people? Is it that, like in that example, have each person create and save their own district map, and then somehow consolidate it? Yep. So you can always save your own and then you can make the changes to there. So if you know that you have yours, you can even lock that district. So you share it and you've locked district one, but someone else has made changes to district two that you want to include. Then after you've shared it, they can edit your map. They save it as their own and they're editing your version with the locked district one. So even if they're trying to make changes, they have to physically go in and unlock that district to make changes. Because it's kind of putting a restriction, all right, don't change this one. They have to actively go in to unlock it to make changes. Yep. So I'll repeat what Natalie said. There is a comparison button and within the system itself, it'll compare the differences between two plans and that's where you can see those changes. Um, and this is a tip that if you're looking for a certain plan, if you're wanting to um, find other people who have made plans specifically for um, your district or your neighborhood, or if you're looking for people who have done plans um, for like Riverside, then you can type in Riverside. And if someone has used that in their description, then you can find their plan and say, oh, this is what they made. I wanna use that as my starting point. So after you've made changes, then you can reach out to them, it'll say, whatever your name is that created it, and you can see about coordinating with them to get added to their group. Will, will it just, um, when you do that type of search, will it just show ones that have been shared for the, like, the public? That is correct. Anything that has been shared with everyone, because everyone is current users and future users. So if you create a plan today, and you've made it available for everyone, someone who joins in two months will see your plan. Oh. Any other questions? Okay. Um, as we mentioned before, all the slides and videos will be available on the website. And these are the Esri links. Yeah. So have you already received requests to register groups? Already. Yes. How many? I think so far we've only gotten two communities of interest requests. Mm -hmm. But we do already have like all of our neighborhood associations, yep. all the alliances. We already have all of those um, identified as kind of our communities of interest in the starting point. So. Can we repeat? So to repeat the answer that Michelle just gave, there are already 
two communities of interest that have been registered and the information's available for more. Let me, let me see if I can uh, add a clarification. Not all neighborhoods will necessarily be communities of interest. So for example, uh, the Cultural District Alliance may decide that they'd rather have more than one council member representing them with uh, Council uh, District 9 encompassing everything east of university and Council District 7 encompassing everything west. They may be happy with that arrangement, uh, but if they want to be sure that they're contained entirely within one council district, then it's in their interest to, to register as a community of interest so that uh, uh, that will be one of the criteria to be met. Uh, so uh, as a general rule, we want to contain entire neighborhoods, but uh, if you want to ensure that people will give due consideration to your neighbor boundaries, the best thing to do is to register as a community of interest, if that makes sense. Yes, sir. Uh, Michelle, are you? It, it, basically, we just need a map of the area that you want to propose as a community of interest and, and, uh, and, and some evidence that you properly represent uh, that area. So uh, we can't just have uh, an individual saying, I represent everybody without some evidence that you, you are the duly elected person. So now I know if, if, if Rusty Fuller submits uh, so, uh, a proposal on behalf of the North Fort Worth Alliance, we know that Rusty Fuller is president and so forth, and he speaks for them. Uh, uh, but uh, anyway, we just need some evidence that you, you have the authority to, to represent the, uh, the area to be included as a community of interest. So th thank you for that question. And that's the end of my slide deck. So feel free to stick around and ask questions of the city staff as you have available. I appreciate you coming out. Thank you. <laughs>